Coming up on Chasing the Natty, as the season starts to approach, we need to get back to basics and take a dive into arguably the most important position in all of sports, the quarterback. We'll be covering the top players of the position, who we think are overrated and underrated, what do we think about the quarterbacks who have risen throughout the offseason, and what super duper deep sleepers at quarterback could pay off massively down the road for you. Strap in everybody, it's about to be a wild ride. All this and more coming right after this. Junior touchdown! Marvelous Mar. Ball next to the outside, drop down for Franklin. Oh, majestic touchdown! This is Chasing the Natty, a college fantasy football podcast. All right, welcome in everybody. This is Jared Palmgren, host of the Chase and Natty podcast. I hope you guys are having a wonderful ride to your work on this Monday morning. We are the College Fantasy Football Podcast on the Campus Canton Podcast Network. You can find us on all of your podcast feeds and YouTube every Monday morning at 7 a.m. If you want to support the great work that we are doing, head on over to campusagain.com and subscribe there with one of our three fantabulous tiers. You'll find everything you need for your CFF, Devi, or C2C needs, including rankings, articles, tools, and so much more than even that. On YouTube, you'll also find our CFF Mock Draft live streams, where we do a CFF draft every Sunday night live with a different guest lined up up until the start of the season. This week we have on JD Yonke. So if y'all have not gone and checked out that episode, it should be live on YouTube for you guys. By the time you're listening to this, definitely go check out that as well. JD is always awesome to have around. Speaking of which, if you want to get involved in that, you can DM me on Twitter. I'm at CFF underscore Jared. You can also find the show on Twitter at Chasing the Natty. Got some awesome stuff going around around here at Campus of Canton. Uh, first, we've got the home field discount. If you go to home field, you got the promo code Campus of Canton. Get off 15% off any of your vintage college gear. Just grabbed myself a Georgia uh, vintage shirt. They just released a new line of that, so I grabbed one of those th- this past week. And also, we have the CFF guide. It is now live on campusofcanton.com, so go check that out. Pretty much has everything you need for your upcoming CFF drafts spiel's over y'all we are talking quarterbacks today again we're getting closer to the season it's about time we kind of you know brought things back down to basics we've been covering a lot of topics the last couple of weeks but to kind of catch up a lot of you guys who are starting to to you know rise from your coffins or wherever you go during the off season and you need to have kind of a catch up on what's going on with CFF here. So we're going to take a deep dive, a crash course, if you will, into the quarterback position today. And to help us out with that, I have brought on the CFF QB guru himself, Mr. Chris K, who has been exceptional at finding quarterback value the last couple of years with some of the diamonds that he has been able to find in very, very rough areas. K, how are you doing today, sir? I'm good. I'm good. This is QBs are fun for me. I've had good success, but I I think maybe this year's prediction, while not the hottest of hot takes, might uh, burn me down. But we'll see. Uh, (laughs) I'm sure you're gonna be fine. Talk about today. Yeah, actually, I noticed that. Like as as I was looking through the show sheet, like for some reason, we're not gonna talk about JJ today. Well, I guess we will a little bit because like he's in the top 36 quarterbacks, but there's no reason to, to. hit on that one and i think there's some other guys too we'll probably touch on that we've talked a bunch about but i figured it would be worth looking at some other guys because i think there are some really interesting uh interesting ones uh this position is like super stacked as well so it's fun to talk about a position like this where you don't have to necessarily care uh worry so much about like committees and how teams will use guys because there's only one starting quarterback and yep. for the most part we all know who they're going to be so Yep, and he, the quarterback position definitely is fun. I think you and I both agree, Kay, that this year, pretty much, and we'll get to this as we go into the rankings a little bit, there's kind of a clear top tier of guys that we're kind of okay with seeing go in the first round, but then there's a huge, massive second tier of guys where it feels like it's kind of okay for them to go 
as high as like QB eight, and, but they could also go down there as low as like, you know, QB 30. Like if somebody were to put them in the rankings like that, I wouldn't really tell them off that much. You kind of agree? Yeah, I think there's a clear top five and then the rest is kind of like your, what's your flavor that you like? Um, what kind of like uh, strategy do you have? We both draft the same way. I think when it comes to these best balls where we're waiting on quarterbacks, if we don't go for one super early, uh, which also makes it interesting because I think pretty much all the different guys that we draft with, or at least I'm drafting with, are doing similar. So you almost have to feel like you're reaching if you want a specific guy and not worry about it. So a little bit of a counter to other people's strategies, which is always interesting. I'm personally okay with like some of the guys that go off in the first round. Like I have my fair share of Frank Harris, who we'll talk about here probably in a minute and everything like that. I've, I've drafted him in the first round. Austin Reed, I've grabbed once or twice in the first round. Shoot. If I have the one on one, I'm still taking Caleb Williams. Probably like, I'm not going to like, I'm not going to pass up that opportunity to have him on my team. So like, I'm okay with that for the most part, but for the, but again, for the most part, I completely agree with you. Again, round seven to ten is my range, and I'm probably going to hammer that a thousand times during this episode today. Speaking of which, let's just go ahead and get on into it. We're going to start. This show is going to be broken down into several different segments, and you're going to see this pattern the next couple of weeks as we cover the different positions, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, um, tight end eventually as well we will cover. But first, we're going to kind of run down through the top 36 at the position and we're going to start with the top 12 we'll go through 13 through 24 then we'll go 25 through 36 and we're not going to cover every single one of these guys because you know k has a life and i know i have a life as well i got i got a, i got a, a new job to actually prepare for now it's crazy um so what we're going to do is that we're, i'll name off the top 12s just so you can hear the names and everything is that way if you're completely new to cff this off season you haven't really paid as much attention you'll know the names but then Kay and i are going to dive into two guys in each range that we think it is the most important to talk about at the position so let me go ahead and run through the top 12 here so number one caleb williams usc number two bo nix oregon number three austin reed western kentucky number four frank harris out of UTSA, number five, Drake May out of UNC, number six, Michael Penix Jr. out of Washington, number seven, Riley Leonard out of Duke, number eight, Daquan Finn out of Toledo, number nine, Joe Milton out of Tennessee, number 10, Tyler Shuck out of Texas Tech, number 11, KJ Jefferson out of Arkansas, and then number 12, Jordan Travis out of Florida State. So just thousand mile high view of this of this top 12 here k what's kind of your main takeaways from this bunch uh i mean definitely the tier break at like the five six just depending on how much you like Penix, and then like for me i'm just thinking joe milton it feels it feels like it could have been a like a a good buy or low by low option but it was so evident that that quarterback position for tennessee is so profitable that that uh, he's been ranked high. I'm, what is he? What's his ADP for quarterbacks? So this, I, is, this yeah. is based on our personal rankings. So this, yes, maybe sir. the ADP might be a little bit more friendly. So yeah, you bring up a good point, Kay. Um, these rankings that I just listed off are based off of the five CFF rankers we have here over at Campus Scan. Is myself, Kay across, Kay down there, uh, Chris Moxley. Uh, Nate Marquise and Justice, all five of us kind of combine our rankings into one for one consensus ranking. Joe Milton's ADP K is going off as the QB 10. So we have him ranked as QB 9. He's going off as a QB 10. Yeah, so that's like a little bit, that's still the same thing, you know, like it, it, I don't have really any Joe Milton and I like Joe Milton, obviously. Um, Bazooka Joe. Bazooka Joe, right? But uh, it's just, it's hard to get behind it considering the other options around him he had the the downside which we'll get into i know so yeah i was say uh, um like again we're gonna name each of our two most in quarter, important qbs in this range and well joe milton's one of my guys so i guess we'll start there okay again the main question with joe milton is which joe milton do we get do we get the guy we saw in michigan who was struggling horrendously or do we get the guy we saw destroy Clemson, a great defense in the bowl in the Orange Bowl last year? Systems there. You got uh, Hennon Hooker who finished as a QB twelve last year, who is on track to finish even higher before his injury took him out in Week Eleven. Joe Milton looked good when he, uh, Hooker was out. 
But here's kind of the downside of it. Milton looked good at those games, but what if he does revert back to what we saw at Michigan? And things fall apart for the Tennessee Volunteers real quick. This is a guy that, like Kay just had me tell you, is getting drafted pretty high. Again, tail end of the fourth round, beginning of the fifth round, typically in a lot of CFF drafts. If he falls apart, if he falters, like if it, if it truly like reverts back to kind of his old ways, Tennessee has that shiny new toy there in Nico Iamaleva, who quite frankly looked really good in the spring game. Again, a lot of people say he's raw, but quite but also Tennessee's offense is really not a super difficult one to understand for young quarterbacks. So I could totally see if they truly believe that Milton is going to be able to do it, they could stick in Iamaleva. But here's the thing, if Milton starts for all 12 games, he's absolutely fantasy gold. And quite frankly, if you, if you told me right now he, that Milton starts all 12 games, that tells me he does not truly falter enough in any game to risk being replaced by the freshman behind him. And that means he's been fantasy gold pretty much the entire year and quite frankly should be a first rounder right now. But that's the big question is, does he revert back to his old ways? What do you think, Kay? Uh, he's, it's really interesting. I was trying to remember back to like the actual 2020 season. Um, and you know, I'm looking at the, the box scores from it and you, I think you'd be surprised at like how he started for that season, like against big 10 teams. Cause that was COVID year. So they didn't play non-conference stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, he had two games of 300 passing yards. He had, you know, the first two games, he had uh, 111 rushing yards and 20 carries. So like, those are like super productive numbers, tons of volume, which is interesting. Like, why did Harbaugh throw it a bunch during the COVID years? Like the COVID year, which makes no sense. He didn't um, care. Maybe maybe that's a good sign for JJ. Um, but he completely fell off the the tracks, right? Like he looked awful against Wisconsin, and then then they barely beat Rutgers, and he was pulled halfway through. Like, I think years later we'll see a, a more refined, polished version as much as you can get. I don't think he's like an NFL quarterback by any means, but he'll be drafted high because he has some skills. If he gets around the right staff, whatever, he could be really pretty decent, but the volume is going to be there. He's a mm-hmm. big guy. He's proven to run well. He connects well with squirrel. You know, he's got a ton of different options in terms of receivers. It's truly like if he can stop throwing the ball three feet above every single receiver's head, then he'll be unstoppable. You yeah. Know, he will be like a first rounder. So that's he is a very important top 12 player because you're investing a lot of capital to get him and he certainly has the upside but i would argue he's probably the most likely of the top 12 to bust for non-injury reasons i would definitely agree with you that i think that pretty much sums up why i consider him one of the most important important guys in this group and i'm honestly going to say the same thing about the other guy i want to bring up here because joe milton might be the most likely to bust amongst these guys for non-injury reasons but the other guy i'm going to bring up drake may is the other one i would consider the most likely to bust for non-injury reasons because again that hire of chip Lindsay as offensive coordinator for unc definitely just has a lot of us like turned the wrong way when it comes to Drake May. You are talking about a guy that is consistently, I mean consistently being drafted in the top, um, or being drafted in the first round. Like Even when guys like Frank Harris and Michael Penix start to slip into the second round I've seen recently, May is still sitting up there. I think a lot of people are remembering what happened last year. They're kind of expecting that to continue to roll. But like If Chip Lindsey does come in here and kind of mess up this offense like he has at so many other spots, it definitely could end up being very, very costly for Drake May owners who are investing a first round pick. Like Joe Milton, you're investing like a fourth, fifth round pick into him. That's a pretty high pick, but it's nothing like investing a first round pick into Drake May, who I still think if May... Even if Lindsey messes up the offense, I think May doesn't have the floor, the like, or doesn't have the low as low of a floor as Joe Milton does in terms of what could happen to him. But like, even still, like for as much as you're investing into him, I think it's definitely important that we get Drake May right here. Supposedly, he'll have a ton of off, of control over this offense, but I'm really not even sure what that means. Again, like I. You know, we don't hire players to be offensive coordinators. So, like, when people say that, they're like, oh, he'll just run the same thing as last year. I'm like, 
Maybe, but like, you know, he's still not a coach. But here's the thing. All that concern out the window. What if he is fine? What if what if this is just what they did last year? Then you got a guy who finished as a QB4 last season, seven top 15 weekly finishes last year. You have an absolute monster. So again, it's a complete risk reward guy being taken here in the first round. I personally have not drafted him once because I like the safety of a lot of other guys. And that's what I look for in the first couple of rounds is a lot of safety. But Kay, what are your kind of thoughts on Drake May? Is there anything else here that I haven't really brought up? Uh, no, I think you covered it pretty well. I also am not drafting him like uh, Mill uh, Milton, but it's a little it just kind of because I'd rather like Bo Nix or Frank Harris. And those two are typically like at or just after him. Um, so sometimes, you know, May doesn't even get to me, but. You know, I you bring, you bring up a good point of like him having control of the offense. You wonder like how smart is it to do that with a twenty one year old, twenty two year old? Like, I, if I that's even know. true, right? But the alternative is also that it's Chip Lindsay. So like, what's what's worse there, right? Um, he did the hard thing for me is to get past how he ended the season, which mm-hmm. was just awful. Good point, right? He was super, really just underwhelming the last three weeks, and they were also the the hardest games. The more difficult opponents, which isn't going to happen every single week in the ACC, obviously, but it that kind of has stuck in my brain enough to where there's enough change in like offense and things like that, where I have just shifted my, my uh, picks elsewhere. You know, Bo Nix has a change in offense, um, lost a couple guys, maybe to transfer or what have you, but like, and he didn't necessarily end the season well, but he was also hurt, but I, I don't have any issue with him because I think, you know, there's enough um, continuing offensive uh, staff and personnel around him that he'll be fine. Plus Pac-12, you know, so I think the situations are kind of the same, but different. I am not going to draft May. I'll let everybody else do it. And I don't think like compared to the other guys that I'm drafting, like Bo and Reed and, you know, even like Penix or Harris, like they provide the same amount of upside and maybe a little bit less in terms of uh, risk. So yeah, definitely the main reason why I wanted to bring up May as one of my most important guys in the top 12 was because I think a lot of people, especially if they haven't been paying attention during the off season, if they haven't been um, doing a ton of drafts or anything like that, or they haven't been listening to the show or any other um, resources out there, they might be going into this thinking like, oh, it's Drake May. He's back at UNC. There's no changes there. This is one of the safest picks in the draft that I can make. And they don't realize just how much risk there is going in. Again, it could all be totally fine. But there is a huge amount of risk there for a first round pick. So, okay. Who are some of the guys that you're looking at here in the top 12 that you consider the most important? So these, the two I went with are, well, I'll go to the first one, but they both have the same common theme of just like high usage running quarterbacks that uh, were banged up last year. But if they can just stay healthy, they're easily QB ones and could easily fall into the top five quarterbacks. So the first one being Daquan Finn from Toledo. I'm a big Finn fan. I mean, he's looked good against everybody until he got, you know, that, I think it was like an ankle injury and he started to struggle a little bit. And then, you know, the volume of rushing it uh, carries running carries are just there, right? Like that's like a common theme for me is you're going to have a high floor with these guys that have a ton of carries. Um, so he's going to get the, the ball a lot. He's a pretty decent passer. I mean, I think too, I think in his third or fourth year at Toledo, he'll continue to improve. The schedule is super soft, but it's just a matter of like, he's a little, He's a little thin, I feel like, for a a running quarterback. So can he withstand a full season? I mean, it is the max, so it's probably likely that it's not as hard to finish a full season compared to, like, a Jaden Daniels trying to finish with 190 carries in the SEC. Mm -hmm. So the reason that I listed him here is really because his upside is so high. He was doing so good before the injury last year. It's just a matter of, man, if you – I think you have to draft him in some places because his upside is just so high and it's not being seen in his ADP. It's not at all. If I can pull up his ADP right now, again, he's being taken as the QB 17. That puts him right around the... uh, Where are you, Taquan? Yeah, Taquan. Um, He's being taken right here around the end of the seventh round compared to some of the other guys being taken ahead of him. 
what people also don't realize is like when they look at his like fantasy points per game last year, like if you look on fan tracks, it says like 26.32, which is already a great number, but that's also being heavily weighed down by a super weird final game where they like tried to play him. And like, he ended up getting like 0.6 points and they took him out like after one series and that drags his average down completely. So if you take that game out, he averaged, when he started a full game, 29.2 fantasy points per game. If he continues that, he'll be an absolute monster next this upcoming year. And that's frankly why I've been drafting him at his ADP, if not a little bit higher, pretty much the entire offseason. He basically played three quarters of a season in terms of the regular season. He yep. still had... You know, 23 passing touchdowns, or I should say 21 passing touchdowns and eight rushing touchdowns, 600 rushing yards. Like, that's insane. You could project another 150 rushing yards, a couple more TDs. Like, those numbers are just crazy. And if you're drafting a guy that could be a top five quarterback in the seventh round, I, you know, that's incredible. And worst case scenario, you get maybe six, eight weeks, and then he does the same thing. But that's why he's here for me is just the upside is just absolutely insane for what he's being picked at. Absolutely. What about Tyler Shuck? You, you Tyler, named him as well. Tyler Shuck is kind of the same boat. I mean, that Ole Miss bowl game was incredible, wasn't it? Like, oh, yeah. Just pounding the rock. You know, I 25 carries, is, 111 the yards. Offense is, the offense, the volume is what you want in a quarterback. They're going to pass it a ton. They're going to run it a ton. Um, you know, they're going to play from behind you know, a ton of the different games. So the game script will help. The running backs are good at best, right? I don't think anybody's worried about someone vulturing carries from them, things like that. So, I mean, it's just really hard to not love that. Mm -hmm. The problem is we have seen Chuck got, get hurt a couple of times. There's a guy waiting in the background with Morton yep. where, you know, the whole Wally Pitt thing could happen. Chuck could get hurt, Morton would come in and he did that last year and looked great. Does Shuck come in and play the bowl game or play any more if Morton doesn't get hurt in that, like at the halftime of that one game in, in last season? Like it's possible Shuck's not even on Texas Tech's roster if Morton doesn't get hurt last year. So that's where he's being drafted a little bit more aggressively though, correct? He's got to be like fourth, fifth, sixth round, right? Um, Mr. Shuck is being drafted as he's actually going after Joe Milton. He's in the middle of the fifth round. He's QB 11. Yeah. Like definitely more than sense. Finn. Definitely more than it's, Finn. It's because uh, it's Texas Tech. I mean, Texas yeah. Tech's been a staple of fantasy forever. Now it's a little bit different, right? But like in the games he started, he basically had 40 like 40 carries plus attempts, you know, like how do yep. you say no to that? Um, and like for other reasons I already mentioned, like they're going to score points. It's just a matter of like, you know, how is Shuck going to do it? Right. Is it on the ground? Is it through the air? So we also got to hope that not only does Shuck stay healthy, I think we need to see some of those receivers stay healthy. Cause I think that was kind of an underrated aspect of Texas tech last year was like so many other guys between price, between Foundry, between Bradley, like, Missed some games here and there. They were just banged up so they couldn't play 100% and everything like that. Like, again, they hopefully just an entire team just just not get bit with the injury bug like they did last year. And I think they'll be an absolute monster again for fantasy. It would also be nice if one of those guys like stepped up, right? Oh, yeah. Like, these, a lot of these other very friendly pass offenses have a guy that is truly the guy, right? Like Malachi yeah. Corley and Marvin Harrison and, and some of these other ones. I think like Washington State's kind of in the same boat. Do they have yep. a number one guy that's truly going to come out there and be it? Uh, I think we all have like a gut feel on who that might be. But like, you know, there's three or four different Texas Tech receivers that seem interesting, but legitimately we have no idea which one it's going to be. And we're sitting here thinking, okay, like is is like Dre McC uh, McCray going to be the guy, right? He mm -hmm. showed at Austin P, right, that he was really pretty good. So it'll be interesting. He is another guy that truly could end up top five. Wouldn't shock me at all. I would say, oh, okay, yeah, he was just healthy the whole time. Yep. But like the there is a little bit of if when you get used this much, there is some concern about will he survive? That's just always going to be the case with these dual threat quarterbacks. If I could guarantee you a full season of health for Tyler Shuck, K, where would you put him in these rankings? 
uh, I'd probably put him bef- at number six or five, Penix or May, just uh, maybe, maybe six. But I wouldn't, it would, you know, that's a toss up for me at five for May. One thing that's different for him compared to Finn is he's 6'5", 230. Yeah, he's, a, he's like, a big boy. He's a big guy, right? And I think his injury last year was a shoulder. Yes, I believe I so. I say like, like he uh, dislocated a like a non-throwing arm, right? So like, you know, that's nice. You want to keep the lower body healthy. And he's so big that you feel like you can take the, those hits. So yeah. yeah, if he was fully healthy, without a doubt, would be a fifth fifth or sixth quarterback for me yeah shuck was out with a left shoulder injury so his non-throwing shoulder all right let's move on to the next tier of qbs these are you're going to be probably your second quarterbacks on your roster that you're looking at here so let me run through these guys real quick i'll try to do it quick so that you guys aren't bored to death by just all the names here 13 curtis work out of ohio 14 john rice plumley out of ucf 15 michael pratt out of tulane 16 jalen daniels out of kansas 17 dylan gabriel out of oklahoma 18 siobhan cordero out of san jose state 19 kyle mccord out of ohio state number 20 Cade klubnick quarterback out of clemson 21 preston stone out of smu 22 donovan smith out of houston 23, Brennan Armstrong out of NC State, and 24, Jaden Daniels out of LSU. Okay, we're going to go to you first here, man. Which two quarterbacks out of these guys would you consider the most important to discuss regarding your second quarterback on your roster? I'll say Donovan Smith. Um, Again, right, same theme that I've had the, the other two quarterbacks that I've talked about. Former Texas Tech quarterback, now at Houston, I mean, you pretty much could not have picked a better spot for him to transfer to, which is about as shocking of a thing as you can get with a college (laughs) football player. So thank you. That offense should be really fun. They lose Dell, but they add, you know, they have Golden. They got like Stefan Johnson and um, they have Sam Brown. So they have like a pretty deep receiver group. The running back is pretty deep, but it's, again, it doesn't feel like there's a guy that's going to take those like vulture type stuff. And Donovan Smith is another guy that's like sneaky big. I think I can look at it. So up. we're going to, we're going to see a lot of usage out of him. I mean, we literally any of the guys at Texas tech were productive when they were used. Um, Donovan Smith, there's no reason for him in a, I don't want to say a similar offense, but like an offense that's going to throw it a bunch, spread the field, have speed, and then just run it with their quarterback. Right. Yep. Um, the question for him and why I have a little bit of caution is there is a concern that he just might not be very good. He's not really like a true quarterback. Um, so I could see him just truly not be a good quarterback, like not be able to throw the ball well. Uh, I don't know if he's proven enough in, in that regard. And then, of course, too, I think he was another guy that got hurt last year. So I don't want to lean on the injuries too much, but um, it is a concern with like the heavy the heavy rushing volume. Yeah. Dan Holderson in the past has used running quarterbacks and you would think that would be one of Smith's strengths, but if they are worried about the injury thing, I Holderson has been heavy enough in the past game before to where I think Smith will still have value, even if he's not really using his legs, what we like we might think, but you did mention earlier again, he is also a very big boy, exact same size as Shuck. He's six, five two thirty. So he should have the meat on him in order to kind of take some of those hits. But like you said as well, he's been injured a lot in the past. What about your other guy here? You got uh, Brandon Armstrong, quarterback out of NC State. NC State. If you're just tuning in, you're probably sitting here thinking like, no, he, he went to Virginia. So what's going on here, Kay? Well, two years ago, he was incredible. Last year, he was not incredible. He was really awful with essentially the same group of people, but the assistant, the the offensive coordinator left. That's the whole thing here, right? With Armstrong is Robert and I is met back up with um, Armstrong at NC state uh, franchise. We had him on the um, ACC show and he's like a big believer. And I I mean, everybody's a big believer in in an eye, but he kind of phrased it as like, he just knows how to use his weapons. Like he's not, you know, every single year it's, hey, you want this X receiver or you want this slot receiver in this offense, right? With Anai, it feels like he's just going to f- see what puzzle pieces he has and then put them together based on what actually fits. Um, and so he's, you know, the question there is going to be, what happened to Armstrong? Was 
could you like he was so bad is it possible to be that bad after being so good just because a coach was gone so you know? I was just looking at his stats from last year, and at least his uh, fantasy finishes and everything. He finished as a QB sixty-seven, which is a minor miracle in Tony Elliott's offense with all- Tony Elliott's offensive style. There, like they went way more conservative, way less volume for Armstrong than they did the last couple of years. So even in that offense, awful offensive system, how many top twenty-four QB finishes do you think Armstrong had last year, Kay? Top twenty four. I mean, I couldn't even tell you. you know, he had three. Like, like it's would, cra- it, which, with how bad that offense is, like to me, that tells me that Armstrong's better than I think people are giving him credit for in terms of his talent. So, like, it is. It was so seven touchdowns and twelve interceptions. It just makes you wonder. Like, they had great weapons. You could arguably say that they have. You can say that they have better weapons at Virginia that year than they do at NC State this year. Like, I think for sure those receivers were all better. Um, he had that awesome game against Richmond. How could I forget about that? But some of those games, man, you're just watching. And I'm a Virginia Tech fan. Like, I don't have any reason to root for him, but I was playing him because he did get some volume and he, in the past, has been successful. And every week it felt like, you know, guys are dropping passes. He would make bad mm-hmm. decisions. But I think you summed it up well to start here, right? Like, it felt like, they got super conservative. Even if they ran Armstrong enough a lot, it was like in the weirdest, awful ways. They didn't use Keaton Thompson right. You know, it just felt like, it truly did feel like the offensive coordinator impacted that one big time. Yeah. So and he's th- back with an eye and this should be, should be, should be a much better situation. I definitely agree. I've been grabbing a lot of Armstrong in the range that he has been going. Again, Armstrong looking at, you know, 10th round of your drafts, QB 25. He He's one that kind of varies quite a bit. You'll get some people who reach up and grab him in like the 6th, 7th round range. I've seen him fall into like the 13th, 14th round range of some drafts. Like it is kind of crazy how varied he can get. But regardless, I think he's an excellent pickup there, especially as your second or third quarterback off your board right there. So we'll go to my guys that I consider important here. And Kay, your guys were right next to each other. My guys were on opposite ends of this range here. I am going to talk about Curtis Rourke and Jaden Daniels. Curtis Rourke is currently our QB 13. Quite frankly, he would be a top 12. Shoot, he'd probably be even higher than that uh, QB if it weren't for his ACL tear at the end of the season. Injury really is everything here with Curtis Rourke. He was absolutely awesome. Throughout the season, he was QB eight through, or yeah, uh, yeah, he's QB eight through week eleven before his injury hampered. It, um, before his injury in week twelve, in week twelve he tore his ACL. So a lot of information says that he'll be good to go by week one, and I don't want to doubt that because I'm not some kind of injury expert over here. Again, that's that's definitely more Nate Marquise's um lane he does a lot of physical therapy and stuff like that but just based on what i know like about a year's time is what you expect to see in terms of an acl recovery and so that would put it at week 11 of this next season so getting back what 10 weeks in advance definitely seems like a very very big stretch at least just on the surface there but again i've heard of I've heard of like clean ACL tears healing very quickly. Maybe that's what's going on here. I'm not, again, I'm not an expert. And I'm definitely not worried if he will, quote, be the same after the ACL tear. Like we've seen plenty of ACL tears that have just not hampered guys' injuries. It's usually when you see the second or third ACL tear, you start getting worried now. But Rourke hasn't had like a huge injury history there. But here's the thing, none of that could really matter. Again, maybe maybe he does miss the first few weeks of the season, but like you don't draft Rourke for those first couple of weeks. You draft him from action. So you're already probably not drafting him until you and you're not really wanting to play him until you get into like your week five, six range. So Rourke one hundred percent has the upside to be a massive winning QB for you later in the season given what he did last year. If he can repeat what he did last year, he'll be absolutely awesome. Quite frankly, he'll be even drafted and ranked higher than he is right now. It's just that super late season injury that's putting everybody off. What do you think, Kay? 
I was just looking. It sounded like for the spring game, he which was April, he warmed up and did some drills, but obviously didn't play. So yeah. if you can warm up like and have pads on and stuff in April, that that feels pretty good for September. You know, it, it depends um, on the warm ups. If he was doing some like straight line stuff, that would be re- that's a that's a pretty good sign for the spring and everything like that. Yeah, the, the nice thing is you're not drafting him for his running, right? Like, he does score, and he does have some yardage on his – but he's not, like, a volume guy there, right? No. His passing numbers were insane. If you think about it, I mean, he had 3,200 passing yards in the shortened season for him, his injury, and he played at Iowa State and at Penn State and did, like, basically nothing. So uh, that is impressive in itself, just high, high usage there through passing game. What's interesting – on top of that is the schedule. So he's got the double uh, double bye week. So they play week zero. So even if you were to miss it, you don't get it, right? Yeah. You don't get that game, which is a bummer. But it's also San Diego State. Like, he probably wasn't going to be, you know, the best option that week anyways. Mm-hmm. Was, you know, the double bye, it makes it a little bit difficult. I have a hard time drafting him this high if we don't know what like what more of that outlook is if you look at all these other quarterbacks that are here it's just kind of hard to take a shot on a guy like Rourke when there's all these other really appealing options um you know even if i don't really love jalen daniels but you do yeah, okay but then I like i love uh, jrp you know like there's so many options here even if it's not your specific flavor like you will get a guy that you like that you probably don't have to necessarily worry about the risk of him being available. Yeah, for sure. The other guy I consider important in this range, I'm going to the other end of the uh, range here. And that is him. He's sitting right there at number 24, Jaden Daniels out of LSU. QB 11 last season was one of the few top 12 quarterbacks to return this season. Riley Leonard Even him, like, again, we have the top six guys we mentioned earlier, Williams, Reed, May, Nix, Penix, Harris, those guys right there. Even Riley Leonard gets taken in the fourth round, so he's going to take it pretty highly. Daniels is the only top 12 quarterback from last year that consistently slips down draft boards. Um, Again, he's kind of risen up a, a little bit recently, but I've seen him go as late as, like, round eight, nine, ten sometimes in that range right there and it definitely kind of perks my ears up you look into what he did last season again finished qb 11 super super up and down season last year his fin- weekly finishes were qb 34 qb 34 qb 31 so solid but not great start to the season right there followed that up with three weeks of qb 87 qb 82 qb 52 abysmal for a guy that finished in the top 11, but then follow that up with a QB5, QB1, and QB17 finish. Great weeks right there. That's what you want to see right there. And then he follows that up with the Arkansas game where he finishes a QB142 that week. And then he finishes semi-strong with the QB13 finish there at Texas A&M. Those back-to-back 48-plus point games total for 31% of his total pointage. It's just so up and down. It's why I think people are kind of willing to back off of Daniels just a little bit, especially in a redraft format. In a best ball, yeah, you're probably willing to jump up and grab him just a little bit more. But in a redraft, like a lot of people really thought that he was going to go off in that Arkansas game last year. And it was just an abys- it was abysmal game all around, but especially for Daniels, like finishing 142nd among all quarterbacks in the country. Guys, there's only starting quarterbacks on 131 teams. So you got to remember that was the hot cocoa coffee game where it was like seven degrees outside. Remember? Was was that, was that, that was, was, was that super cold? That was the freezing cold. Uh, Malik Hornsby got benched at halftime or something like that. Oh, I remember. It was it. awful all around. So I will give him the benefit of the doubt. And he's a guy I actually think is being drafted too low. So maybe I can save some of my points for later. But insane volume. His early season was, I think he's a actual good passer for college. Like, I don't think he's, I don't love his NFL prospects compared to some of these other guys, but like, he played he was awesome against southern but they blew him out you know they blew out new mexico uh you know he barely was used in the auburn game for some reason 
you know, I think just generally speaking, you're going to uh, gonna get a ton of usage out of them. 170 carries in the regular season last year. They don't really, I like Logan Diggs is cool for sure. He's a good running back, but like that's not changing how they're going to use or how they're going to run their offense at the goal line. Right. True. Like they started really hammering him around the goal line and just using him a bunch in the running game. And that's when he started to really blow up. I think he'll evolve a little bit as a passer. I think they'll continue to use him as a runner. I can understand the caution uh, because he was so up and down. And I definitely am more in favor of him in best balls compared to redraft or like in your dynasty leagues. But I think, I mean, he's got like put you away type production upside, right? Like he can pretty much end the other, you know, end your matchup in one game. Right. So I very, um, I, I, I shift my focus to those guys. You know, that type of 50 point upside is just absolutely insane. Yeah, 100%. The fact they did it on back to back weeks was also pretty insane right there. You're right. Okay. If he can just become a little bit more consistent on a week by week basis and improve his arm talent a little bit to where we can trust that side of, side of his action just a little bit more, you are looking at a guy that could be an absolute unstoppable force in cff on a week by week basis and considering where he's getting drafted like you can if you take a very safe option with your first qb daniels is a guy that if you want to just swing for the fences on a guy and hope that he like hits that 50 point upside on a week by week basis he's the perfect guy to grab in the second round range and part of the reason why i consider him to be one of the most important guys in the second tier the other side of it is does if he falters more like that Arkansas game, if that be, if that becomes a little bit more consistent, it's not like LSU doesn't have another quarterback just sitting right there that looks really really good in Garrett Nussmeyer. Again, I'm fully anticipating that Daniels will be the starter. I'm not one of these people that says Nussmeyer will overtake him, but if if Daniels does start to falter, like LSU has another option. So that's kind of the other side of the risk there. Yeah, you do wonder what they think about their quarterback room. Obviously Daniels is going to start. I think they've already like come out and said it, which is, I mean, the way that they use Nussmeyer in that bowl game makes you think that they actually really, really like him. Um, And with good reason, I think he's awesome. Uh, You know, if they lose the first game and how, you know, how does Daniels play in that first game and they lose, you know, they have national championship aspirations that are completely legitimate. Mm -hmm. So like, do they feel the pressure later on in the season to say like, he is He's not producing like he did last year. You know, we need a spark in the passing game. You know, uh, there is definitely, I don't know if LSU's offense can be run the way it was run last year and make it to the playoffs. It's kind of like my feeling on Michigan and how, like, if Michigan wants to win a national championship or just win a playoff game, like, they have to do more. Mm -hmm. What if LSU could suddenly, you know, not suddenly, but what if LSU says, you know what, like, we need a little bit more from our quarterback. We need to be a little bit more well-rounded. Um, that can happen. I mean, Brian Kelly, I mean, he benched um, he benched a guy a senior years ago at Notre Dame, and I think he put in Ian Book yep. when he was like a freshman. So wouldn't be out of the realm of, uh, of you know, not happening. I, I could see it happen. There is a world where that happens. I love Nussmar. I was drafting both of them at one point pre-portal because I thought, worst case, I have a handcuff. Um, in case something happens to Daniels, best case, you know, I get Nussmeyer to transfer. But obviously, that's not going to happen anymore. But, you know, the talent is definitely there in that QB room. Yes, sir. All right, let's go ahead and move on to our third and last year quarterbacks here. We're going 25 through 36 here. Malik Hornsby out of Texas State at number 25. Number 26, Jaden Delora out of Arizona. Number 27, Cameron Ward out of Washington State. 28, Davis Brin out of Georgia Southern. 29, Chandler Morris out of TCU. 30, Taylor Green out of Boise State. 31, Mitch Griffiths out of Wake Forest. Number 32, Quinn Ewers out of Texas. Number 33, Garrett Schrader out of Syracuse. At 34, we got Darren Granger out of Georgia State. And number 35, J.J. McCarthy out of Michigan. And 36, Will Howard out of Kansas State. I'm going to go ahead and dive right on into my two guys here. And first, I'm going to start with Malik Hornsby. And some of you are already groaning because it feels like we've talked about Texas State a ton over the last month. Don't worry, guys. I'm not going to reiterate Hornsby versus Finley here. We've done that to death 100 times already. Let's say 
for the sake of argument here that Hornsby is the guy. Why do we care so much about why he is at Texas State? I think that is something that I think has gotten lost a little bit over the off season is that people kind of started thinking like, oh, a lot of other people are on Malik Hornsby at Texas State. I should be on him too. But nobody's really stepping back and saying, why are we doing this? Well, one, obviously, Hornsby is one of the most athletic guys maybe in all of college football, but definitely in the Sun Belt. His legs could be absolute dynamite there. The other part of it is G.J. Kenny's system moving to Texas State. What G.J. Kenny was able to do at Incarnate Word was, quite frankly, just abuse to all of his opponents throughout that season at the FCS level. If you take Lindsey Scott Jr.'s numbers from last year, they played 14 games, so you shorten it down to 12 games to kind of compare it to a college football season. If you tabulate those into fantasy points, Lindsey Scott Jr.'s numbers would have been good for the QB1 last season. And uh, it would not have been close. He would have beat Bo Nix by 92 points. That is almost 25% more points than Bo Nix scored last year. That is just an absolutely insane offensive system that G.J. Kenny was able to run in Incarnate Word. Now, you have Malik Hornsby, who's not the greatest passer, but neither was Lindsey Scott Jr. They're both in bad conferences. If everything comes together for Malik Hornsby, and you are able to grab him in this range of the QB 25, oh boy, you have like the ultimate, ultimate home run play right here. There's a reason why people were kind of willing to draft him up as high as uh, round five or six earlier this offseason. He's come down a little bit to QB 10 because of the TJ Finley transfer coming in there and everything. But if he starts and this offense does so well, that's why he's one of the most important guys in this range right here. Because this is a guy in this range that has QB1 upside. Not just, oh, he's good for me on a week-by-week basis. No, this is a guy that if everything goes right, will finish as a QB1 and may not even be close. But here's the thing. There is a downside there. Again, we got TJ Finley coming in. There is reason to wonder if... You know, the staff really does trust Hornsby at this point because of that. You don't know if Kenny has the offensive pieces in place to fully run his system because, quite frankly, Jake Spavadol left that place in an absolute mess in terms of the pieces that they could work with over there with the Bobcats. So, Kay, your thoughts on Hornsby there? I feel like I hyped him up enough, but there's like it's like the there's just two complete ends of the spectrum can be seen here. You have your side, right? Uh, well, I should say the pos- super positive, like offensive system um, side, just from in a vacuum, that makes a ton of sense, right? Like his numbers were, Lindsey Scott's numbers were insane. Um, but then I, I think you have to look at it from the other angle of like, okay, well, you know, like Cameron Ward came from this same offense. He was pretty average at best at Washington State, um, you know, you look at the schedule that they played incarnate word is pretty awful. I mean, they won at Nevada and Lindsey Scott was awesome. So there's that, but it's still Nevada. They played a bunch of awful teams, right? Like awful. one team doesn't even have a logo on ESPN, right? Uh, Hornsby. We saw the Arkansas game. We got benched. Cade Fortin came in for him. Like, but and the other back to your side, Jared, like the offense, ultimately offensive scheme matters. It's G5, so like the Cameron Ward comparison, maybe that's the most, that's maybe not the most applicable comparison, right? Like, yeah. because this is, is going to be a schedule that's going to be softer than what Ward had to play at the Pac 12. Hornsby has insane rushing ability or at least speed. Um, and you don't necessarily have to be as good of a passer to be effective in this offense. So, it truly goes both ways. I can see why people are drafting him. I can see why people are staying away. I think I have a little bit, uh, but this TJ Finley stuff has scared me off of Hornsby enough where I'm just not worried about it. Cause if they think TJ Finley has a shot at being like the guy, then it, that actually concerns me whether it's their, I'm concerned about their brains or about uh, Hornsby's talent. One or the other is just not what we think it is. So it's a fair way to truly, look at it. He might, he might be the most polarizing 
upper like high floor low ceiling guy there is this season at the quarterback position oh 100 percent. and the other guy here is kind of the opposite in terms of mitch griffiths who's the other guy i consider one of the most important guys in this range right here because sam hartman finished as a i think qp 14 last year so that's kind of the ceiling of that offense like sam hartman ran that offense to near perfection was an absolute monster week in and week out only missed one game last year so he probably could have finished higher if he played that week one game mitch griffiths in the one game that he did play seemed to run the offense probably not as well but like you know 90 percent as well as sam hartman could so you're looking at a guy who can come in pretty much pick up right where Hartman left off in this system maybe he doesn't reach that you know QB1 upside right like QB1 like top 12 QB upside right there that like Hartman could reach but this is a system that year after year even when they're not putting insane levels like they were with Sam Hartman like it's still a pretty safe guy like you're looking at probably a guy who even if they're not going guns blazing in this offense probably still finishes with like a low QB2 upside. So it's just an extremely safe system. If you're looking for a guy that you don't really love your first two options at quarterback in terms of how safe they are, Griffiths is a great late pick here in this third tier of quarterbacks right here. What do you think, Kay? It makes a lot of sense. Um, that offense is produced. Hartman's been awesome. Um, I My question marks here are going to be like, how much of a runner is Griffiths? And not like in the speed category, but like Hartman made his money in terms of upside because he had like 11 rushing touchdowns two seasons ago, right? Like, yep. And it's not like he had a ton of yardage. He had decent yardage. So I, I'm curious, okay, how much does Griffiths run? How effective is he? We got to see him play that one game against VMI. It was VMI, but yeah. they're quality. In terms of FCS, they're solid enough. They're not like amazing, obviously. But he didn't really do much rushing there, but he was really good passing. Um you know, he doesn't have some of the receivers that Hartman had. Hartman was super successful at the end of his career when he was like year, I guess it was like year four and five. Is he a sixth year guy now? I think he's a fifth year guy now. So uh, he had a ton of snaps under his belt before mm-hmm. he really shot up. But it wouldn't shock me for him to throw, you know, for Griffiths to throw for 35 touchdowns. Um, oh. It's just a matter of, okay, does he add anything on the ground? Like, can he get me... 200 rushing yards and five rushing touchdowns. Like, if he does that, then he's a phenomenal pick at his ADP. Well, look at what Hartman did last year. Like, Hartman threw for 38 touchdowns, so three less touchdowns than what you're kind of looking for there. And Hartman, 102 carries, 129 yards, only one touchdown last year. You kind of mentioned two years ago where Hartman got the 11 touchdowns, but he didn't need that last year in order to still finish as a top four, top 15 QB in CFF. So, like, again... I agree with you 100% that like part of what made Hartman so great was how many years he had in this system. But also Griffiths has been around for a couple years now. And again, we saw him play against VMI, like you mentioned. And again, he looked good. Again, I don't think he'll be Sam Hartman, but I still think he has that upside for sure. I think it's within his range of outcomes if he just comes out, picks right up where they left off. So what about UK? What are, what are some guys you're looking at in this range that you consider the most important? I will say I do like Griffiths because he's not being drafted like aggressively. So, no. you know, it's just if you're thinking like huge upside, that's where some of that Hartman rush factor comes in. But um, two more runners, one of them, let's start Taylor Green, the Boise State quarterback. I mean, yes, he was sir. awesome. Uh, I can't believe, man, he had that phenomenal game filling in for Bachmeyer in week one, right? Um, and then they went back to Bachmeyer for a couple more weeks before he hit the portal. And Green hit the ground running. I mean, he had like, I think he had like a 91 yard run at one point in the season. Um, true freshman who really was super productive. Question marks for me are, I mean, well, and he's a big size guy, like impressively big guy. My question marks for me are going to be like, okay, well, he had 10 touchdowns rushing on 81 carries. Like, how sustainable is that? That's like a, of pretty, course. a pretty high TD rate. But, He's also a big dude. Like it's completely possible for him. Maybe it's not ten for an eighty-one, but what if it's ten for an one hundred and twenty? Like that's a, you know that's not really that wouldn't be unsurprising. Not especially considering he uh, didn't play a full season. Um, you know, we see these freshman quarterbacks come out of nowhere and play really well sometimes. And how often do they replicate it? 
We'll see his passing, you know, who are his receivers? I, I need a little bit more in the passing game, I think, for for that upside that we're looking for in a in a big quarterback. Uh, and I don't know if the receivers are there. Like Stefan Cobbs is back, but like man, he disappeared. Their greatest strengths are their are their running game, right? With mm-hmm. Polani and GT. So I like Green. I've drafted him a bunch, like in Dynasty, like in a startup for Dynasty. I think he's like a top. I don't know, 30, 40 pick, like pretty yeah. easy overall. Like he's that he's got that much potential and upside. But just to play a little devil's advocate, some of those rates feel a little bit unsustainable. Um for sure. What about the other guy here, Chandler Morris out of TCU? Chandler, I have two words with Chandler Morris, and it's just Max Duggan, right? Like if Max Duggan can come out of essentially nowhere, I mean, we saw Max Duggan for years. He wasn't like anything super special he had some good games and he had some good relatively good seasons but it was nothing like this past season um but you know with this is the sunny dykes era right like so chandler morris he beat out max duggan and uh then he you know got hurt slash just didn't play all that great to start um and then you know duggan never looked back but like morris won the job for a reason he had to have right so that gives me some some interesting positivity there. They have a ton of weapons at receiver. They lose their big Kendra Miller running back that like was phenomenal in big plays. Um, so you know that's always a little bit nice for the quarterback to to not have to worry about a sixty yard touchdown run by the running back. But ultimately, it's just system mixed with the fact that if Dykes can make Max Duggan be a Heisman contender, like why wouldn't Morris be able to? I'm also going to throw in here that Morris, I think, out of the QBs we'll talk about, at least definitely out of the ones we're talking about here in the first 36 here, Morris is probably going the cheapest out of all of them. QB 46 is in ADP right now, 16th round. Like, you're talking about a guy that, again, if he replicates what Max Duggan did last year, kind of like you said, Kay, like, now granted, I don't think any of us really expected that out of Max Duggan last year, but even still, if he replicates that, that's you know, QB 13, even maybe even higher than that upside. So if you're looking for upside later in your drafts, like kind of your mid rounds and everything right there, Morris is a great a guy you absolutely should go after. So I think it's a great call out. Okay. All right. We'll keep moving along here. So that's our top 36 quarterbacks kind of running through all the different names here, who we think are the most important ones, maybe under discussed, maybe ones that like, these are the names you have to know about whether it's a good or bad thing. But now we're going to move over into a bit more negative territory. Okay, we each identified three quarterbacks that we think are going too high in drafts right now. I'll go ahead and start with mine because two of my guys are pretty much the same argument here. Uh, My three quarterbacks are Jordan Travis out of Florida State, KJ Jefferson out of Arkansas, and Sam Hartman out of Notre Dame. I love Jordan Travis and I love KJ Jefferson. I think they're both going to be very good quarterbacks for you in CFF this year. But here's kind of the biggest hangup I have out of them. Travis finishes the QB 30 last year. Jefferson finishes the QB 26. They're currently going both in the fourth round on average, QB 7 and 8 in drafts. What warrants drafting those guys so much further ahead of other quarterbacks who finished in the same range as them last year. Like, let's take a look at this. Jaden Delora, who finished ahead of both of them, by the way. Jaden Delora finishes a QB 21 last year. He's getting drafted as a QB 27 in the 11th round. That's seven rounds later, you're getting a guy who finished in the same range. Michael Pratt, quarterback out of Tulane, QB 31 last year. He's currently being drafted as a QB 13, but three rounds later than either one of Jordan Travis or KJ Jefferson. Shavon Cordero, which again, Kay, you clearly don't really like him that much, given that he's one of your guys that's drafted too high, but even still, QB 33 last year, currently being drafted as QB 18. He's in the eighth round, four rounds later than KJ Jefferson and Jordan Travis. Daquan Finn, we talked about his upside earlier. QB 34 last year, being drafted as a QB 17, three la- rounds later than Jordan Travis and KJ Jefferson. Okay, make it make sense to me, man. Like, do, Can you think of any reason why those guys are getting drafted so much higher than any of these other guys are? Because the only thing I can think of is that, one, people are buying into the Florida State of hype with Jordan Travis, which I totally get. Again, the teams get a lot of hype. You think they're going to score more this year? Fine, whatever. KJ Jefferson, I really don't understand why he's being taken ahead of all these other guys, considering 
they're all pretty much the same quarterback in my opinion. That's why I wait until like the seventh to ninth round to start grabbing my quarterbacks. Yeah, I I agree in that like when you look at it compared to other guys and where they're being taken, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, you know. <laughs> Like taking a guy like Travis or Jefferson in the fourth round just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but if you were to say which if, if you like, could you draft those guys in the seventh round? I would still prefer those two over these other guys listed. Maybe not Pratt. Like I think Pratt's awesome and Finn's awesome, but like Delora Cordero, like I they're behind the um, those two are behind these two here for me. I think people with Travis, I looked at it a while back, like. The usage of Travis on the ground two years ago to last year was really, really different. They went from running him like 10 times a game or 12 times a game. I think it was actually 13 times a game compared to this past season where it was six times, like six times a game. Like you wonder what made that shift. What's really nice is his passing got much better. It felt like Mm -hmm. Um, not that it's like high volume or anything like that, but he just looked better. He was more efficient. I think he improved in the passing game completely. So you just wonder, right? Like, I mean, he had a ton of double-digit carry games. He had seven rushing touchdowns in 2021. And then in 2022, it just, like, went away. Like, sure, he had seven rushing touchdowns, but that was in, like, 14 or 13 games, like, added. I can tell you why. It's because they had Trey Benson now. So, well, I think it's a couple of things, right? They they just were super deep at running back. Yeah. Like, they just right? Benson Ward and Toa Feely. Um, I think, and I mentioned this in our Slack, I think FSU might have the best, like they might be have the most unstoppable red zone offense of all time. Like if you think about like the options that they have, maybe not all the time, uh, but if like Travis at quarterback, you have Jaheim Bell who could do wildcat and he's huge. Um, so why not? You have Benson who's big. You have uh, six, I think, Keon Coleman's like 6'4", or 6'5", something like that. He's a big Johnny boy. Wilson, six, seven. They have, a, you know, Morlock is a big guy at tight end, supposed to be a good blocker. You know, if Toa Feely is like your worst red zone option and he's still a good back, like he's maybe on the smaller side, but he's not small overall. So my concern with Travis would be like, the where does the rushing game compare? Is it 21 or is it 22, right? And then... It just feels like the more you think about it, the more they're probably going to look elsewhere um, around the goal line. Your hope would be that they throw a lot of jump balls to these receivers. But if they don't, I don't know why FSU would risk some of the rushing around the goal line when they have Bell and Benson and Toa Feely. Especially considering that Travis is pretty much key to anything that they want to do this upcoming season. Like Any of their goals pretty much go out the window if Travis gets hurt. Yeah, I mean, this. To, uh, if Travis goes gets hurt, they're like a 10-11 win team to like a 6 or 7 win team, probably. Like, it's a pretty um, big drop-off there. It's a huge drop-off. You have a lot of unprovenness there, and it, it just makes you wonder how they will use him. Um, but I do, you know, in the 7th, 8th round, that makes a lot more sense than the 4th round. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, KJ Jefferson, same type of thing, but he's like a higher usage guy consistently. I don't think he's that great of a passer. They don't have a lot of great offensive weapons in terms of like receivers and tight ends. Like I'm not impressed there. They have a great, obviously running back in rocket Sanders, um, but he's a big guy. You know, maybe he gets a lot of those touchdowns. I do have some of him. Cause I just think like, in I'm thinking just purely best ball right now that he's super safe to me. Like he might not have, he, okay. He might not, he definitely does not have top 10 overall quarterback potential in my opinion, but I would be shocked if he doesn't finish top 25. Right? Yeah, no, so, for sure. You know, if you're drafting the QB8, like, that's not a great thing to hear that he's going to be top 25, but there is some value in floor. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also not drafting him probably QB8, and I'm not drafting him in the top five rounds. So, Yeah, I'll go with my last guy here real quick. Again, I threw in Sam Hartman here out of Notre Dame. It, I really think people are just drafting out of name recognition here. Like, they see Sam Hartman, they're like, oh, he's still available as my second quarterback? Heck yeah, I'll take him. Guys, he's at Notre Dame now. This isn't your daddy, Sammy Har- Sam Hartman here. Like, Notre Dame, 
it could still be a very good offense this year, but it's still going to be a much more conservative style offense. There's really no elite passing volume here for Sam Hartman. A lot, I've I've heard from a lot of people like, oh, Notre Dame was a huge running team last year, but like they didn't go and get Sam Hartman for him to just hand the ball off. And yes, I agree with him, or I agree with y'all on that. But that, like, still, what do you see his total passing volume upside per game? Like that they're winning. I, I repeat, like in a positive game script, and Notre Dame's a good team, so they'll win a lot of games. Like 20, 25 passes per game, maybe. Like if they even get that high with him and everything like that. There's no elite passing volumes. There's not really an indication that they're going to run him a ton because SMA and career are going to be pretty much a better running game than anything he's had. And as I kind of referred to earlier, like they like it, this past year at Wake Forest, he didn't really do a whole lot of running there. He gets a downgrade in terms of his receiving core. Like, look at Notre Dame's receiving core. Like, yes, they got some exciting young guys there, but a lot of unproven guys. Basically, at the end of the day, like, do I think he'll be like a 20 to 23 point per week kind of guy? Yeah, sure. That sounds about right. But, like, his ceiling is completely capped in this offense. And quite frankly, that's just not something you want to take as your second quarterback off the board in a CFF draft. So, okay, any quick thoughts on Hartman and then you can get over to your guys in Ward, Ewers, and Cordero. I, I think he did a good job with Hartman. I actually am down on him more than you. Really? Uh, because That's I don't, the... I have his projection at like 18 and a half fantasy points. Oh, you wow. know, I was just, I like... was just low ball. I, I, I was I just know... like throwing something against the wall there, but like, yeah, I, 18 and a half points. Yeah, that sounds about right. To... He would have to get the rushing touchdowns back. He would have to Notre Dame would have to want to throw it more, which I don't I don't see why that would happen. And then he doesn't have any proven receivers that are all that sexy. If you draft Hartman, you should draft a Notre Dame receiver. Like it, without a doubt. There's no reason for you not to because they're super cheap and we know who the top you know, top 2 3 guys are going to be and you can get them for free. So like there's no way Hartman is worth what he's being drafted at unless one of his receivers hits value or like just blows it up. Right. Like Merriweather or uh, Thomas, you know, if you want to get real weird, maybe the freshman um, great house. So like, I don't know. I it's, I just don't see the passing volume like you, but uh, my guys, Cameron Ward, I've been against him pretty much my entire time that he's been in college football. <laughs> He's, you know, he takes a ton of sacks. Like, he's not a bad runner. There are, he's pretty good at rushing the football. He is really bad at knowing when to not get sacks. Like, 46 sacks in 13 games last year. It's going to completely kill your um, offensive, you know, fantasy numbers right there, right? 0.5 yards per carry. He did have a ton of games. Like, it did, he had 500 passing attempts in 13 games. That's awesome. But, he just didn't, to me, never had the big number. You have to – it is actually shocking how much – how little fantasy points you get by just throwing the ball a lot. Like, you have to throw a ton of touchdowns to actually make it worth it. 300 yards and three passing touchdowns is 24 points, if I did my math correctly. Yeah. 24 points is good, but it's not like – that like you're, great. I would say right? you're you're like, you're happy with it on a, on a weekly basis. Like, okay, my QBs didn't crap the bed this week, but like, you're not he three hundred and three touchdowns is pretty nice game. I mean, I think every quarterback would take that, and that probably won't finish in the top twenty five of of uh, quarterbacks weekly. No, not at Same all. Same thing to an extreme with Ewers. Ewers would have to throw thirty five to forty touchdowns at least for him to be worth anything in CFF. Um, he provides negative rushing value. Uh, his only potential positive way to look at it is maybe they don't, they don't have Bijans and they don't have Roshan. So maybe he lucks into some QB sneak touchdowns or something, right? With like unproven running backs. They have a ton of passing weapons. So there is a shot at 35 to 40 touchdown passes. I just am not, not broaching that. I respect his skill. I just don't know if the volume plus the efficiency is going to be there to get the touchdowns. And then Cordero, you know, this one's a little nitpicky. I don't dislike him. I just think he's just being drafted too high. He's a double bye week. 
He had a ton of rushing touchdowns last year on like two yards per carry. You know, it's the Mountain West, so you don't necessarily need to have the best weapons. But like, I don't know that the receivers don't impress me all that much. Their best receiver might be their tight end, uh, Mazzotti. I think he's really interesting. Yeah, the double good. bye week, double bye week is is pretty impactful considering the other guys around him that seem to have as good of a floor with similar to better upsides to me. Yeah, the double bye week definitely hurts with Cordero. I kind of I, I I put in one little stat here as a defense to Cordero because I do have a ton of Cordero. I've drafted a ton of him in best balls. He's one of my favorite guys to grab in kind of that round seven to eleven range of quarterbacks. They a lot like Washington State. Uh, San Jose State gave up a crap load of sacks last year. Like it was absolutely horrendous. They played in twelve games. They gave up forty two sacks. And that totaled to 292 total sack yards. So, like, what did, what did Cordero run on the ground last year? Like, obviously, you can't give him back all of those yards, but like, he it was ran. Like it was like 190 or. I would say it was. Yards, right? Yeah, it was. It was not much. Oh no! Uh, yeah, 265. He ran for last year. So, like, if you mm. gave him back like 200 of those yards, like you would feel like if they get better at holding up those sacks, you're looking at a much better rushing performance out of him there because you you get a four you get 400 um 65 rushing yards you get those nine touchdowns because i really i truly do believe that san jose state's going to continue to run him around the goal line because like that's what they did outside of when he got sacked and this is an offense that does return four of their offensive linemen again i've said it before though like if they're that terrible like how good is it if they're returning and especially since the one guy that is returning is his blindside tackle or that the one guy that isn't returning is his blindside tackle that's definitely some cause for concern right there but even still like maybe if the four other guys are good to go the coaches can hyper focus on the new guy the blindside tackle and be like hey yo don't mess this up um we're relying on you here um I think Cordero will be fine, but again, the double bye week definitely hurts there. And I completely agree with you on yours about like there's there's no elite volume, there's no elite rushing upside. He'd have to have a Mac Jones like season for him to be fantasy relevant, and that could happen because again, like they don't have a great again. The running back room's a little bit of a mess right now. Nobody really knows who that guy's going to be. They have a ton of great passing options, including some of those running backs. So I could totally see Ewers getting 35 plus touchdowns this year, but. In terms of in terms of like betting on that and taking him as a guy, it's like the top twenty four quarterbacks. No, not at all. I ain't doing that. All right, let's go positive. Let's go look at some guys that are being drafted too low. I'll get through these guys a little quickly because I don't want to keep K here forever. So I'll just kind of run through my guys real quick again. Pretty much a lot of them are kind of along the same vein here. My three guys here that I think are being taken too low. Uh, Darren Granger out of Georgia State, Garrett Schrader out of Syracuse, and Will Howard out of Kansas State. Darren Granger finishes QB 18 last year, and literally what has changed to warrant a drop to QB 35, which is where he's being taken in drafts right now. The only thing I can think of is that he lost Jamari Thrash to the portal, but Georgia State's been pretty darn good about finding some of these receivers, these diamond in the rough kind of guys to step up for them in that passing game because nobody knew who Jamari Thrash really was before he got there. Um, Sam Pinckney, nobody really knew who he was. So that coaching staff has done a pretty good job there. And again, you got Robert um, is Rob, yeah Robert Lewis there. Um, I I like uh, Carter, the guy that the guy they brought in from JUCO. So I think they're going to be just fine in the passing game over there. But after that, like literally what changes their schedule is an absolute cakewalk. Like here's their schedule, Rhode Island, Yukon, Charlotte, coastal Carolina, Troy, Marshall, Louisiana, Georgia, Southern, James Madison, app state, LSU sucks. And then old dominion. Like, yeah, there's a couple of tougher games in there, but for the most part, like that schedule isn't much harder than what they face on a week in and week out basis last year. So, He's going way too low. Garrett Schrader's another one here. He finishes a QB 41 last season, currently going as a QB 38 in draft. So you're probably sitting there thinking like, okay, he's being taken right around where he finished last year. That makes a lot of sense. Well, except the fact that he got injured in week nine and basically missed three total games between week nine to 11. So you're missing a quarter of a season right there. And then through week eight, he was a QB 21 on the season. Just absolute monster games early on in the season. Very consistent all the way up until that injury 
basically, if you're drafting him in that QB 38 range, you're just assuming that he's going to get injured again because there's nobody in that room that's going to challenge him. Like Justin Lamson, love him to death. He transferred out. And I am not scared of Carlos Del Rio Wilson, and neither should you. In addition, Traders got a second year in the system now. Again, last year, Robert Nay coming in, you were kind of worried like, oh, is he going to translate well in the system? He did pretty well. And now he's got another year under his belt with Jason Beck running the exact same system over there. So Garrett Schrader going way too low in drafts. And then last but not least, Will Howard, quarterback out of Kansas State. QB 52 in drafts right now. He only played in five games last season. Four out of the five were over 20 points. So very consistent for you on a week-by-week basis there. And if you extrapolate that performance that he gave us in those five games to a full 12-game schedule, he would have finished as a QB 22. Again, not elite by any means, but at the same time, like if you're looking for a safe guy, like this guy shouldn't be lasting until QB 52, 17th round of your drafts. Like, and also, like, he didn't do a lot of running last year, but two years ago, in the limited time that he had, 32 carries, 184 yards, and four touchdowns. So he can run. So if they do unlock that ability, he can finish even higher than that QB 22 extrapolation that was given right there. So, oh, one last thing. Uh, honorable mention to Casey Thompson, but I'm not going to talk about Casey Thompson for the third time in a month. So if you want to learn more about him, just go listen to either last week's episode or the um, mailbag episode we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh Chris Kay, what do you think about those three guys real quick? Uh, I agree with you for the most. I mean, I like all three of them, um, generally speaking. Howard is super interesting to me because you would think that he would run a bunch with Colin Klein. You know, Colin Klein was the famous Kansas State quarterback that just was like a bulldozer. And Absolutely. And awesome for him. And they, yet they didn't really run with him, but they ran with Adrian Martinez so it makes you wonder, like, okay, do they think he's actually a good passer? Maybe he is a good passer. I think I that wanna, has like, more to do with that they were freaking out about the fact that, you know, Martinez was down. If they had to go to whatever QB's behind Will Howard, they were in very, very yeah. big trouble. And they were on a they were on a they were looking to win a Big Twelve championship. So like, they weren't taking any risks there, I think. It's possible. I like I can see both sides to it. And I don't if they throw a little bit more. It's not like the end of the world for him. He seems to be good yeah. at it enough. Um, and he's being drafted so low. Um, so that's kind of there. I, I want to look into that more because I'm I am curious if he, they do pass a little bit more because then what does that mean for the receivers? But Yeah, good point. My three, uh, Jaden Daniels, which we talked about, I just think when you have as high of a floor as he does, it just makes a lot of sense to pick him. I just don't think he's being picked high enough. Um, Jeff Sims. So, I mean, about as raw of a passer as you can get, like maybe a, a small step above um, Hornsby in terms of like passing talent. But Matt Rule is awesome with quarterbacks. He's had productive quarterbacks. And I don't know if he's ever had one that is like this good at rushing the football. Um, at Georgia Tech, you've seen it. You're a local guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was pretty awesome running the football. Super electric. So I'm curious to see him in a in a more let's say in a real offense with a guy with coaching staff that can develop a quarterback, um, and then John Rice Plumley. I mean, like what a what a fan favorite. I mean, the guy's playing baseball games and then running over to via helicopter to play the spring game. Uh, rushing upside is crazy. He's got really good receivers and Hudson and Baker. Um, so I think. A lot of weapons. Gus Malzahn is the head coach, right? And I mean, like, doesn't he feel like uh, Nick Marshall? You know, like just yeah. kind of like your raw passer, but super athletic. Um, I mean, I think he ran for a thousand one year at Ole Miss, like when he was the quarterback. So, like, yeah, he did. It's it's hard not to love. For me, it's hard not to love him. And the schedule doesn't feel that intimidating. I mean, obviously, the Big Twelve is the Big Twelve, but like Penn State, Villanova. Um, you know, and you know, you don't, I don't believe you play everybody in the Big Twelve, right? But like Kansas, West Virginia, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, Houston, like none of those are really all that concerning for me. And then Oklahoma, you know, they're better. They have the name, but like I, Oklahoma's played in the high scoring games. That doesn't like, right. you know, I'm not shying away from that. So I think that schedule is nice. And you know, assuming they just don't go too crazy running them. Uh, he doesn't get hurt. I mean, there's for me, there's no reason for him not to have a huge season. I definitely agree with you. Again, I think the thing that kind of scares people off from Plumlee, at least in 
in regular redraft definitely not in best ball best ball you don't have to guess when he goes off but it's the fact that like he is very inconsistent sometimes like everybody remembers that temple game last year <laughs> where it felt he, like he sh- that that where that offense just completely self-destructed it's it was a weird yeah he's definitely inconsistent and then he has huge games so it's definitely easier to play him in best ball and draft from there but like he was like banged up for a while. There were he was like every single week. It felt like is he going to play? Is he not? Is it a concussion? Is it a hamstring? Like, and Gus doesn't tell anybody anything. Um, uh, so I've you never. never really knew. So, I can definitely understand the the lack of consistency uh, consistency concerns. All righty, we got to keep it moving here. Let's go ahead and go on to our next segment here. Let's talk about some quarterback competitions here. Again, we could cover a whole bunch of them here, but we just straight up don't have time. So, okay, you and I are going to pick out one quarterback competition that if we could get a crystal ball to see the outcome of one quarterback battle, which one would it be? I got them up on the screen, so if you're watching on YouTube, you got the spoiler. But, Kay, which quarterback battle would you want the crystal ball for on who will be their starter? Uh, Alabama quarterback for me. Um, Seems like a pretty obvious one. <laughs> pretty obvious. You know, Central Michigan came into mind, right? Because I It did. That one is like about as upside, much upside as you can get with Emmanuel and Bauer both being runners and the way the way they used them was just crazy uh last year, especially Bird Emmanuel. Um, but for me, I think Bama goes really run heavy this year. Uh if you look at the Milrow game last year when he started against AM, he ran it 17 times. So I think whoever the quarterback is, because, well, I think it's really between Milrow and Buckner. So that's why I say whoever the quarterback is. But whoever that guy is going to be is going to run it 15 times a game. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're both bigger guys, Milrow is huge, like huge. So it might be more advantageous to have him as the the quarterback. Um, but I, you know, Buckner won me money with uh, the bowl game performance he had against South Carolina. I, and he's a... He's an average passer. It's not anything special, but, you know, put some seasoning on him and he'll be better. Uh, so I just think the rushing upside here is huge. I wish I had a crystal ball so I could start drafting him, but it just feels hard to to give yourself a 50-50 shot at zero drafting right now. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, at least they're all going pretty late. Same with this other quarterback battle we'll talk about here in a second. But, like, I'm still on the middle row train. I still think that he'll probably be the starter. I think it's probably the weakest starter that Bama's definitely had in a long, long time. But I think the experience, like the starting experience for him will probably win out for Bama at the end of the day. We'll definitely see. My quarterback battle that I want to know the crystal ball for, crystal ball. Good Lord, I can't speak anymore. Crystal ball for Ole Miss. Man, like I, I want to be so confident that Jackson Dart will be the guy. But... If Spencer Sanders really does overtake this battle, like both either one of these guys really as a starter could be excellent for CFF because like Lane Kiffin's offenses have produced a ton for us in the past. Just look at Matt Corral and others in the past. Regardless of who wins this job, they're going to run. Dart ran 128 times for 614 yards last year. Uh, Sanders, we all know that he can run from his time at Oklahoma State. Given the fact that like the thing we'd like the least for Ole Miss is probably their pass catcher, so they're probably going to want to run the QB a little bit more. But even still, Ole Miss has worked to upgrade their receiving options really all over the field this offseason. You know, bring in Trey Harris at Louisiana Tech, Zachary Franklin at UTSA, bring in Caden Prescorn from Memphis, and even trying to upgrade uh, Quinshawn Judkins' ability to catch out of the backfield as well. Like, they're going to give these QBs every opportunity to succeed, and I think they can definitely outperform what they did last year. And you're probably not going to have nearly as many touchdowns taken completely by Judkins like they were last year. So I would love to know who the Ole Miss QB is right now so that I can start drafting them and I could probably get a guy that could likely finish as a top 24 QB in my opinion. What do you think, Kay? Yeah, that's. I mean, anytime you get the quarterback in this offense, you're happy. Um, both of them will be able to run it Spencer, uh, Spencer Sanders more than Dart, but Dart, I think he had a hundred yard rushing game. Um, and Sanders, Dart, Dart again, ran for 600 yards last year. The big problem was he only had one touchdown. Yeah. Sanders is like, your put it all on the line type, which is kind of nice in CFF because 
you know, he'll go get the, the the touchdowns and, you know, maybe Judkins doesn't steal so many or just, I mean, I, to be fair, he's probably earned every single touchdown he's ever Oh, 100%. So, <laughs> so I don't think he's vulturing. I think it's totally fair. But yeah, I think if you could figure out who that guy is going to be, it'd be awesome. Yeah, I think those are two QB competitions that we would like to see for the future. I think this year, I think it feels like this year there's less quarterback competitions really that feel unsettled than like in years past. Am I crazy on that, Kay? Like, because I, I, I kind of had a hard time kind of coming up with ones for this one. Yeah, um, there there's not a lot of them, at least that matter, right? Like, it feels like if there is a battle, it's like an offense that nobody cares about. Mm-hmm. Um, like, even like Arizona State's a big school, but I I don't really care who wins the job, you know? Yeah. So. No, fair enough. Which is weird, because like, you know, Alabama, Clemson, Georgia, all these guys are not returning their starters from last year. But, you know, for CFF-wise, most of those don't really matter. All right. One last, or you got two two more segments here. Uh, both of these should be relatively quick here. I did want to cover some of the guys that have been rising in ADP throughout the offseason. This is especially helpful for those of you that haven't really been listening a ton throughout the offseason. They're kind of trying to catch up a little bit. Learn some of these guys why they're rising so much since the beginning of the off season to now got five guys these are the biggest risers since the start of the season darren granger my boy davis brin quarterback out of georgia southern cameron ward out of washington state dj uyangalele quarterback now at oregon state not at clemson and then byron brown the quarterback out of south florida Kay, can you give me a quick rundown on why you think these guys have, each of these guys has seen a pretty big shift from the start of the offseason and now, and do you think it's been warranted? That's the other question. Um, it's hard to say. I think the davis Brin one makes a ton of sense. We all saw what the, uh, was it Van Treese, the yeah. Buffalo guy, comes to Southern and was incredible. They have a proven receiver group so that makes a ton of sense to me granger makes a ton of sense i think it's just a matter of like people talking about it georgia state's not really the biggest of uh offenses and teams to talk about i cameron ward i don't get uh dju (laughs) makes sense to me you know uh capable offense pac 12 is fun big guy runs it i mean who knows how good he's going to be passing it um but i do understand why people are drafting him for sure the competition feels a little light behind him. If Charles was a year older, then I would say maybe that's different, but uh, I can't true freshman quarterbacks in the P five scare me. Um, and then Byron Brown. I don't know. I, I don't know a ton about him. To be honest. I mean, obviously South Florida, I rem- I remember he's got some legs. Uh, he probably, what did he go from like being undrafted to drafted essentially? I mean, I he went from QB see- 62 to QB 50 right now, but he's definitely rising even higher than that. So pretty decent uptick. Um, sometimes all it takes is somebody to start drafting them or like, you know, instead of being drafted in the 28th round, somebody took them in the 23rd round. And then all of a sudden it's like people start to look into it a little bit more mm-hmm. when you get these smaller conferences, you know, AAC G five conferences, right? Like AAC, you could play in some really crazy games and, you know, having dual threat ability is certainly a big uh, help. Yeah. And the last two games, this is part of the reason why people are starting to buy into him a little bit more. The last two games for him at the end of last season, when he got full starting duties, 27 carries, 185 yards and three touchdowns on the ground between two games. So, and his passing numbers weren't that bad either, especially in the Tulsa game. 21 for 25, 240, and three touchdowns. Like you said, like that alone isn't great for fantasy, but when you add in the rushing production on top of that, it's absolutely fantastic. So add in also the fact that he would be starting for the Tennessee offense down in South Florida playing in the AAC, definitely a lot to like there. Cameron Ward, I think the one thing we haven't really touched on so much with him is I think people are kind of coming around to the idea that maybe Zach Kitley's offense will be better for him in the Pac-12 than maybe Eric Morris's system was, which sounds crazy because Ward did so well with Eric Morris at Incarnate Word. But even so, like it sounds like, based on our reports, that Ward's doing a better job this offseason than he was doing in the year prior. Kind of Now that he has a year under his belt, he has that experience. He kind of knows what to expect. 
I think that's kind of what is pushing him up draft boards a little bit. People are coming around to that. But again, QB 19, which is where he was being drafted in June, probably a little high even for me right there. Because again, I view him as a great like QB 3 option. So like once you get past your top two quarterbacks in your team, shoot for the upside of the Zach or of the Ben Arbuckle system there with Cam Ward. But I kind of get it. So, and then you kind of covered all the other three guys as well there. So again, those are some of the guys who've been rising. Some names to get familiar with if you haven't been paying attention this off season. Last but not least, this is a little gift for all of you that have made it to the end of the podcast here. What Kay and I are going to do is we're going to give you one quarterback outside of the top 20 rounds who could finish QB 10 or better. We're giving you some guys that, you know, have QB 2 upside, even some guys that are going pretty high in your drafts that we think have QB 1 upside. But what about these late, late guys? These guys that, you know, people aren't given enough credit to truly understand what their upside is. So, Kay, I am going to start with you, sir. Mm. What? Give me your man. Uh, all right. So this is it's kind of crazy. The guys that are being taken in the top twenty rounds. So the the options were thin. Uh, I think if you're gonna if you're going to find a guy like this that's gonna go from nowhere to top ten overall quarterbacks or whatever, you have. And I've said this the entire time, so I apologize. But like, you have to provide up rushing upside because yeah, no sure uh, for sure because we would know if a guy was gonna throw forty five times a game like we know those offenses so like how does this guy come out of nowhere well you know he starts being super effective on the ground high has to be a good enough offense has to typically be against you know playing behind most of the time so i'm gonna say garrett green of of west virginia all right i I appropriately dubbed him as baby bow last year the reason being is that like you see him at least bow at auburn Uh, bow nicks at auburn was like incredible one play and absolute idiot the next and i think that was a lot of coaching Mm -hmm. um and the fact that he didn't progress at all like literally at all he maybe even got worse in his three uh, three seasons at auburn but you could see the glimpses of it green last year i think he got hurt in the third game he started but basically was gonna i think he was gonna on pace for 12 to 15 carries in all three games that he started he would make a, a throw a dime for 70 yards then he would throw a pick six, you know, he'd run, get have a sweet run for 20 yards and then he would fumble it, you know, mm-hmm. like the consistency just wasn't there last year. My concern would be the coaching aspect to it. I think their coaching staff is pretty dumb. It's just not good at West Virginia. They're also cooked. There's no way they it, make it through this season. Yeah. So you just wonder if he's going to get some help there. Um, but I do think he has like the, high upside rushing ability and has shown enough throwing the football. Like he's made some pretty incredible throws and some pretty dumb ones. So I think he has that, that potential. I could also see him not being the quarterback by week six. So like, that's just kind of what you get with some of these, you know, predictions. Yeah, of course. Like, again, like there's so many things I could poke here in terms of like where it could go wrong for green, but like, that's why he's going outside the top 20 rounds. I'm not going to knock you too much again. Like, you know, you could argue like, again, West Virginia is not going to be very good. Touchdown upside is probably limited with him. Like um, they got a tough schedule and everything like that. Like there's plenty of things to poke at here, but that's not what we're here to do. We're here to have fun and think about the guys that like, you know, if things work out for you here, you get a guy that's an absolute steal. In terms of a guy that I think is an absolute steal for a guy that's going to round 20 or later here, Emory Jones over at Cincinnati. This became a lot clearer the moment that Ben Bryant entered the transfer portal and left Cincinnati. Emory Jones is now starting at Cincinnati. I really doubt that uh, Brady uh, Drogosh, who is the true freshman there, he looks really good, but I doubt he ends up starting for this year. Emory Jones definitely feels like a good one-year rental for the Bearcats over there. Rough, rough year for Emory Jones last year at Arizona State. And while, again, I don't think Emory Jones is the greatest quarterback in the world, I really blame a lot more of that on just how terrible Arizona State was last year in terms of the end of that coaching staff. I think Kenny Dillingham should get them up and running pretty good because I think they have a lot of good pieces over there. 
But Emory Jones goes to Cincinnati where Scott Satterfield is now the head coach. And we all saw what Scott Satterfield was willing to do with Malik Cunningham the last couple of years. Like Scott Satterfield does not need a quarterback that can throw the ball super well or have tons of great options outside. All he needs is a couple of halfway decent running backs and a quarterback that can run. And you can run a pretty consistent offense there. And they do have that over there at Cincinnati. Emory Jones in 2021 ran for 759 yards on the SEC. Like obviously last year was rough, but even so, like he has that kind of upside to go against really good defenses and still put a ton of numbers up on the ground. So I think he should have no problem if he truly is comfortable in this offense over here at Cincinnati to be able to do that to a Big 12 schedule. So again, Mike Cunningham a couple years ago finished as a top 12 QB, very nearly the number one QB in all of CFF. If Emory Jones really does fit in this offense, I can't see a reason why he wouldn't be able to do, or why that wouldn't be in his range of outcomes. Yeah, I think people are thinking about Cincinnati like it's, uh, is it, who's, who, Fickle? Luke Fickle. The guy? Yeah, for some reason I was like, that. Eh, it's not Fickle. Um, I think people are thinking about their offense, like Fickle's offense, which was, or team, which was more ba- based around uh, defense and controlling the football and things like that. And uh, I don't think we see that. And the comparison to Cunningham is interesting. Obviously, they're different types of runners, but like Emory Jones has proven that he can be successful. So I like I like the call out. Um, and he he doesn't have the the scare that I get with Green. Like Emory will be the quarterback all year. I would be shocked if he's not. Yeah. So at least you have some safety there. Uh, and his rushing ability is really nice. So I do like that call. Yeah. No. Again, like. I- I pretty much got the green light for Emory like the moment that Ben Bryant transferred out. I was like, okay, so this is a guy I'm now targeting very late in my drafts because it makes all the sense in the world for things to come together for him to have a really, really good season. So in my opinion, if you're past round 20 and you're looking for, if you're looking for huge upside at the quarterback position, shoot, honestly, with his rushing ability, Emory Jones provides a pretty decently safe floor unless he completely craps the bed this year. Why not take a shot on him? I would I would highly target him. I'm sure I'm about to move him up like five rounds on draft boards, but still. That's what we do here. All right, Kay. Any other final thoughts on quarterbacks before we get on out of here, man? I, I, I'm going to not talk J.J. McCarthy, so <laughs> end this before I can. Yeah, again, I appreciate all of you guys listening. Again, we're going to do more of these. Um, next week, we'll be doing running backs. We'll do wide receivers the week after and then tight ends to finish it up. Really just wanted to give you guys something a little different to kind of give you a crash course in terms of everything you might need to know kind of heading into the season on the guys that are at the top, which ones we think are going too high, which ones we think are going too low, what quarterback competitions to be looking for, what competitions to be looking for, Um, and then also just give you some guys that are going really, really super late in drafts that you could take a shot on and maybe have super high upside because we know you guys love those sleeper calls. So we're going to give you some of that. Um, Because again, like other guys are doing a great job. Again, over there, Chris K, you guys in the BTR pod, you're doing a great job with your conference preview series. I'm excited to hop onto that in a couple of weeks um, with you guys. But again, if you want great breakdowns of almost every team on a very short basis, that's a great place to go over there. Um, so, but we're going to keep it positions over here. So that's what we're going to do. It should be a ton of fun. Really appreciate you guys listening. Again, we'll see you guys next week for running backs. Keep an eye out for our CFF live draft streams. If you're interested in those, just reach out to me on Twitter. Until then, really appreciate you guys. I hope you guys have a wonderful and blessed weekend. See y'all.